Thank you for listening to the message today. We would love for you to share in the comments how God is speaking to you through his word. If you would like to join our online church community, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon on our YouTube page so you're notified when we post a new weekly sermon. You can also learn more about The Rock Church by visiting our website, rockag.com. If you are in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area, make sure to come visit us for Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. We would love to meet you in person. And if you would like to support this ministry today, you can donate by visiting our website and clicking the giving tab at the top of the page or by texting the amount you would like to give to the number 84321. Then follow the instructions in the text reply. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you. Can everybody say praise the Lord? I tell you when I, amen, when I walked into the building early this morning, and Tim, thank you and all our worship team, and I know they're on the way in. Let's give them a hand note. Their goal is not to play good music. They do play good music, but to usher in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, when they were practicing this morning, I walked through the doors, and the presence of the Holy Spirit was tangible. And healing testimonies, you know, we had a healing uh, service, what, two Sundays ago, and Mark, God is touching Christine. It's mighty. And thank you for shouting that out. Amen. Uh, I don't know, for some of y'all that don't know, I've had some difficult physical struggles. And in that service, actually, the man's, you know, the man of God of faith and mighty prayer, I could barely walk that day. A lot of y'all didn't know that. Even had to have somebody pick the oil up for me. And then y'all prayed for me at the end of the service, and God, God has healed my back. I'm telling you, I could, I couldn't bend over when I left. I could, I could, and I'm still bending over. How about that? So God's still touching, and uh, I'm still doing my due diligence and doing what I'm uh, supposed to do. But I feel the love and the presence of the Lord in the house, and I expect miracles, not just when we come together, but all throughout the week. All throughout the week. Uh, I've been preparing you. You are in for such a special and powerful time today and treat today. We have the Harpers with us. U.S. missionaries Jack and Sheila. Save One Ministry. So by now, we, play, we don't ever play anybody's video twice. So y'all are special. Uh, but we, pl we played it a couple times. And maybe it's because these are Tennessee folks that live just right across the border from where I was born and raised. And so maybe there's something about rednecks and hillbillies connecting at the heart. <laughs> Sheila was telling me this morning when Houston greeted her, and I might not get the words right, said, oh, you, you're from the South. You've got a Southern accent. And so, you know, we pray in folks like that that talk like Darla and I. Uh, but just, I, I'll make this short, but I want to honor them and give honor where honors do. I, I believe when we met them the first time, we were in Missouri at a national leadership meeting. And I met Jack before I did Sheila. He, they both, they pastored a church, uh, again, close to my home, right across, the, or right in that area. And Jack was the Tennessee men's director. And that's where I believe we first met Jack was with directors from all over the country. Uh, and then what I remember the most, <laughs> and I guess I, I'm excited about Father's Day. You know, they had a breakfast yesterday and had steaks for breakfast. Well, I've trained them in well because I'm a steakitarian. I, I, I believe in meat. And we got prizes, uh, I mean, meat boxes to give away. I think that's a man thing, ladies. I mean, does any ladies here like steak? All right, maybe your man will win next week. Uh, yeah, Nebraska corn-fed beef, yeah, but anyway. Uh, what I remember impacting Darla and I's life, and I think we were at the general council in Anaheim. Was it, it was so one of those general councils, and we went out for steak, <laughs> and uh, they began to share their heart about save one. And y'all don't even know this, but it touched my heart. And even in that short, it was probably a long dinner meeting, but 
because we get to talk it, is Sheila and Jack taught me some things about healing as it pertains to abortion that I didn't ever know. And I never forgot it. And just love these people and love their ministry. And they touched Darla and I's heart. And we've stayed connected ever since. And that's been some years ago, a few years ago. But I know this morning, and Sheila's going to come first. And then Jack's going to preach with an accent. Hallelujah. <laughs> but they are going to touch our hearts as much or more than they touch our hearts. I know it. Let's give them a hand, Sheila, as she comes. Let's give them a warm welcome this morning. I just love your pastors. They're so wonderful. And can I just tell you that not every pastor is open to having the subject of abortion talked about from the pulpit. So it takes a brave man and woman to have that. And so you're rare. And so thank you for, for having that courage to not care who you, whose feathers you ruffle, but you know that you are, you have an audience of one to make happy. And that's what's important. But anyway, my name is Sheila Harper. I'm the founder and president of Save One. And what we do is we help men, women, and families recover after abortion. And a lot of times people will, you know, will ask, or occasionally we'll get the question, well, why are you helping those people after abortion? Aren't we trying to stop abortion on the front end? And it is our philosophy at Save One. And for the past 23 years, what we have been experiencing is that this is the number one deterrent to abortion that we have. We have been doing a good job on the front end with the pregnancy centers and things like that, but through while Roe was in existence in our country, there were 65 million people who walked out the back door of that abortion clinic. That's just the women. We have that many men who have lost fatherhood. This is not just a woman's issue. And then we have grandparents and siblings of aborted children, people who even drove someone to a clinic years ago, and then they saw their friend's life go off the rails and they felt guilty for have, being part of it. And so it's like they're looking for somewhere to go and lay down this grief and they don't know where to go. And that's where Save One steps in. We are resourcing the local church. We're not trying to turn people to save one. We're not trying to say, look at us, we're the hero. We're pointing people to the local church and resourcing the local church to reach out in their communities and help those men, women, and families who don't feel like they have anywhere to go and lay down, lay down this burden. I speak from experience. When I was 19, I had an abortion. And it was by far the most regrettable mistake of my entire life. I spent the next seven years just hating myself. I began to rely on drugs and alcohol just to get through the day, just numbing my conscience. And during that seven year period, I attempted suicide. And I knew all of those problems stemmed from that abortion. I realize now why. This was a choice that was different from other sinful choices. This was a choice I was never created to make. There's no little girl or little boy that when they're young, they dream of one day growing up and having an abortion or experiencing an abortion. It's never on your radar. You don't write about it in your diary when you're 10. You don't think it's ever going to happen to you. But there I was at 19, and I realized because we were never created to make this choice, when God created us as men and women, he put within us a nature to nurture and protect our children. That's why as a parent, oftentimes, we would take a bullet for our kids and not even think about it. That's our nature. That's who he created us to be. Abortion goes against the very nature of who God created us or what he instilled in us. And so as a man, as a woman, when we choose abortion, 
God is the only one who is sovereign. He is the only one who should be making life and death decisions for another human being. But when we choose abortion, we insert ourselves into God's role, and then we bring on these God-sized consequences that we were never intended to bear. And so because he didn't put that kind of nature in us, we don't have the emotional, the mental, or the spiritual capacity to deal with the aftermath of this choice because we were never created to make this choice. We were created to choose life for our children. We were never created to choose death for our children. And so you go around and you're like, you don't know how your normal coping skills don't fix it. And usually we have deductive reasoning and critical thinking skills and we can reason our way out of a problem. With this one, you can't. And so you get caught in this vicious cycle trying to deal with it when in reality the only thing that fixes it is a divine intervention. And so when you're, when you're going through it, you don't know. You, the enemy starts planting seeds saying, God will never accept you back. You're too bad. You've done too much. And so you go through thinking, I can't turn to the church. Nobody in the church has ever had an abortion. What would they think of me? But through that seven years that I was believing all of these lies that the enemy was planting in me, I finally found my way by accident to a, a Bible study much like the one Save One offers now. And it was just for people who had had an abortion and were suffering afterward. Well, I went to this Bible study and the people who were, were running this study introduced me to a Jesus who forgives the sin of abortion. And I haven't been able to be quiet about him since then. Because I don't want anybody else, I don't want any of my brothers and sisters to believe the same lie that I believe, that abortion was somehow going to fix a problem when in reality it leaves you with a lifetime of regret. I would cut off my right arm to have my daughter here with me. And so you, you live with this knowing, but, but I, I explain it to people, once you have gone through and you've had that divine intervention, it's like you have a scar, but there's no pain involved with it anymore. You remember what happened, but you're healed. And so what we're seeing at Save One is Revelation 12:11 lived out. This is why I know abortion recovery is the key to making abortion unthinkable even before it becomes illegal in all 50 states. Revelation 12:11 says we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And when you overcome the enemy, the enemy, what did he come here for? To steal, kill, and destroy. What is the entire mantra of the abortion industry? Stealing, killing, and destroying. We become more powerful than the enemy whose agenda it is to steal, kill, and destroy when we're covered by the blood of the lamb and we just start talking about what God has done for us. We become more powerful. And so when people go through these Bible studies in the local church, it's not anything magical. Jack and I have written in the women's study, the men's study, and the ripple effect that we have. It's not anything magical we've written. It's just God's word. Focus like a laser beam on that wound that abortion leaves you with. And so when people come through these studies, they can't be quiet. <laughs> they want to go tell people. That's not part of the Save One program. We don't throw you on a stage and say, now go tell everybody you've had an abortion. We don't do that. We just let, I mean, if the Holy Spirit leads you, that's great. But that's never a requirement that you have to go tell everybody now. But it's an incredible turnaround. It's an incredible transformation. And the people who go through these studies become some of our loudest advocates. They come the, become the greatest warriors for life. They become the most loyal church members because they're so thankful that they had a place to come and lay this burden down. And so a lot of times we think, you know, you're probably sitting here thinking, I know there's nobody else in this church who's ever had an abortion. And you're sitting here and you have had one or you have experienced it or maybe you forced your daughter to have it 
or you paid for your son's girlfriend's abortion. I mean, there's so many scenarios, and you're thinking this has never touched any of these other families. The statistics are one out of every three women of childbearing age has personally had an abortion. And a lot of times we think, well, that's so sad for them out there, but it's just as prevalent in the church as it is outside the church. Those statistics don't somehow magically stop at our church doors. And so if it's one out of every three women, that child was just as much his as it was hers. And so that's one out of every three men who have lost fatherhood. And, there's, and like I said, there's two sets of grandparents attached to each one of those children. One abortion touches up to 25 people. My whole family grieved my abortion. They didn't find out about it till years and years later. So this is not just a simple, you know, abortion may be outlawed here, abortion isn't happening anymore. Well, let me tell you, even though we had that incredible victory last year, it's coming up on a, a one-year anniversary of Roe being overturned, they have found a new level of evil. We now have chemical abortion that we're fighting where you can just order the pills right off the internet. There are 72 websites right now offering these pills who used to, they're so strong, they used to have to be administered by a doctor. All protocols have been taken off these pills and young girls are ordering them off the internet. Traffickers are ordering them and spiking drinks. Pedophiles who are, who are I mean, this caters to the people that we want to stop because they can cover up their crime and cover up what's happening. And young girls are thinking, well, this, is, this isn't gonna be bad. I'll just take a pill and it'll be over. But that's not the stories that we're hearing at Save One. We're hearing stories now that are 10 times more traumatic. And I don't wanna go in and be graphic, but you can use your imagination what's happening in these girls' bathrooms. And so now, <laughs> What used to, when we started Save One 23 years ago, when people would come to us, they had been carrying this burden 10, 20, 30 years. Now it's 10 days, 20 days, six months, because they're so traumatized, they are looking for anybody who can help them. We're having to train in a whole new way because you can't just take them and say, oh, we've got this Bible study. <laughs> Let's put you through the Bible study. We've got to take time with them and help them process what just happened. So it's a, it's a, 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 new, it's a new level that we're fighting now. And so I love coming to churches who partner with us, who help us. It makes me want to go to every single one of you and hug your neck and say thank you because we have stories like uh, my friend Wendy who's on staff with us. We had a, a mom who said, who wrote us and said, my, my, I just found out my daughter is scheduled for an abortion. What do I do? How can you help me? And so we hooked Wendy up with her. Wendy said, hey, let me talk to her. She said, no, she won't talk to anybody. And she said, well, let me just send you an email. <laughs> Through an email, she wrote her story and said, this is what I did. These are the pills that I took. This is what really happened. But this is what God did for me. And she started telling her story. And then the mom called and said she chose life after she just simply read an email. One of the vendors that we use at Save One, she's like somebody, I've never even met her. She, she's like, she just does work for us occasionally. Well, she knows my story because she puts things together for us. She's read it a thousand times, you know, like make this pamphlet or put this book together, you know, or whatever. And so she called me and said, you're not going to believe what happened. I've never talked to her on the phone. And I said, what? And she said, a, a girl that is associated with our family, 17 years old, came to us and told me she's pregnant, but her mom wants her to have an abortion. She doesn't know what to do. She thinks that's what she's going to go do. And she said, I didn't know what to say, so I just told her your story. And she changed her mind. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, it really is true that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That's just an email and somebody else's story. 
and it overcame the enemy in these young girls' lives. And so now we're connected to these girls. We're sending gifts. We're making sure they're being taken care of. And it's been incredible. I have story after story after story like that where we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So thank you for making that happen. Thank you for partnering with us to see that happen. What we, we thought was just a, a Bible study that was going to be held at our church, we now have nearly 400 locations in 28 nations around the world. It's been incredible. We're in 42 states here in America. We only have two chapters in Arizona, in Fort Mojave. We need about 1,000 or 2,000 here in just in the state of Arizona. So we're open to you guys, to whoever wants to talk to us. We're AG US missionaries. We're, uh, we're <laughs> going strong. It's been incredible. We're looking for a missionary associate to represent us here in Arizona. So if you're, if you're interested in working with us, come and see us at the table. Come and visit us anyway at the table. Get yourself a t-shirt, pick up our resources. Our Bible studies are out there. But we want to talk to you. We want to get to know you. We want to hug your neck. That's a southern saying. I don't know if you guys say that here. Do y'all say that here? Hug your neck. Do you say bless your heart? That If somebody says bless your heart, that's not a compliment. Okay, I'm just going to tell you that. <laughs> it's a southern thing. Like, oh, bless her heart. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I love you guys. Thank you so much. We want to hear your story. Come and talk to us out there at the table after church. But I'll turn it over to Jack now. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. Pastors Dale and Darla, thank you guys so much. Y'all, y'all know y'all have a treasure in, in them, right? Yep. You could give them a hand right now. That would be awesome. We, we meet people all the time, and, and there's just a difference. There, there's something different about them. There's, they're Southern. Um, <laughs> And I did want to say, if you guys have problems with a word, just they'll translate later when I get finished. So make sure you take advantage of that. But seriously, they, they are incredible. And then worship this morning. Thank you, guys. Wow. Listen, so, so here's, here's what happens. And, and most of us know this, but it's just good to be reminded. The, the Lord says He inhabits the praises of His people, Okay. So what did he do? He came and he took up residency here this morning. And that's why there was just such a, an incredible spirit that was, that was with us while we were worshiping. But guess what? He didn't leave us because he doesn't leave us nor forsake us. And, and the reason he didn't leave is because he has work still to do with us. So whether you came this morning, I, we know when we come into a church that it's just different. That churches don't usually talk about this. Sometimes church has never had a sermon on life. And so we, we realize that sometimes we just kind of tear the bandage off of a wound that may be you know, hurting inside. We, we get that. But here's the thing. The Lord stuck around with us this morning. The Holy Spirit is here to move and to comfort. That's one of His things. He comforts. He's a friend. He's a comforter. And He leads and guides us into all spirit and truth. And so those things that may be just wearing us out, He's going to show us in His Word how we can get back to it. We can get back to health with that. And I'm going to tell you this. You don't have to have an abortion wound or have participated or have something going on around abortion for the Lord to touch you this morning. And the reason being is that He's here for all of us. He didn't just come for just one subject this morning because, you know, He can handle all subjects at all times. He handles all prayers and He's with us and, and he just not gonna, He's just not going to leave here and leave us sitting here thinking, man, I wish it could have been about something else because I've got something going on in my life. Listen, He's here for us. So let's pray and let's get started. Lord, we love you. We thank you. God, you never leave us nor forsake us. You're for us. You're not against us. Lord, you... Um, God, you, you in, in your infinite wisdom, you sent, 
You sent your word to the earth. And the Lord Isaiah spoke it and said, by his stripes we are healed. Jesus came and he lived that out. He fulfilled that. And Lord, it's still ongoing today. So no matter what it is that's going on in our lives, God, you've already taken care of it. You, you've made preparation for it thousands of years ago. Jesus, 2,000 years ago almost, took care of it and fulfilled those prophecies. And then today, healing still happens in our physical bodies. It happens with us spiritually in salvation. It also happens in our minds, Lord, and in our mental health. So, Lord, it, whatever it is that's going on in this room today, Lord, if you would just still go ahead and start speaking and just start... So just begin that process of healing. Lord, we would just be honored and grateful. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, you know, uh, the world is kind of crazy right now. And the, the, the enemy is just having a good time with the craziness that's going, going on in people's lives and how they act and the things that are going on. And what, what, what's happened is that we have gotten to this place where, it, as Christians, we have to live counter to the culture that we are being conditioned to live in. That conditioning has, has been going on a long time. It didn't just start with uh, social media. It didn't just start in the 70s or 60s. It started actually in the garden. And if you'll remember, the, in the garden, the enemy kind of slithers up to Eve and says, has God indeed said you can't eat of every tree? And what he was doing is he was conditioning her to think differently than what God had spoken. And it's been going over on for years and years and years. Some of you guys will have a little more experience with this than I did. But in the late 60s, they decided that our schools would be better without prayer. And does anybody think our schools are doing really well today versus the 1960s? No. And then in the 70s, they started conditioning us. This is what they said. It's just a clump of cells. It's just a clump of cells. It, it, they're amorphic. They're not going to turn into something. And then technology kind of caught up with what they, the lies they had been propagating. And all of a sudden, we start seeing 3D and 4D images in these ultrasounds, and people realize they've been lied to. And the lies hurt because they made decisions based on the lies, and now they're looking for help. And that, that, that is where most of the people were coming from for a long time. And then they told us the Supreme Court says this is okay, and so people made decisions based on the Supreme Court being the law of the land. They wouldn't make a, a law that would be against us, that, that would hurt us. And then last year, in June, on the 24th, the Supreme Court overturned that. And can I just tell you that we had people from all over the country contacting us saying, I can't believe I made that decision and now they've made, they've made the law different. I, I've messed up. Our calls, our emails, our contacts, our hits on our website almost doubled last year after June 24th because people are, they're, they're upset about the decisions that they made that, and listen, I'm not pointing fingers, they just, you, have, you have to justify that some way and that's what they had done, they had justified it that way. They're lying to these, to these young ladies and telling them it's just going to be a bad period. And it's so much more than that. And so this conditioning has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. It's the enemy's playbook. It's to, as Sheila said, it's to kill, steal, and destroy. And you would almost think it's almost hopeless with this situation and this one particular subject. But there's a second part of that verse. John 10.10 10 says that he came... For nothing but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and life more abundant. And if Jesus came to do that and he did, then it's available for us in here and now and in eternity. And so what we need to do is we need to just get our eyes focused on Jesus and off of the, 
off of that conditioning that's been going on forever. We have to live counter to the culture that we've been living in. in, in and listen, people want to argue. It, it, I've never seen anybody win an argument on Facebook. Are you guys with me there? My goodness, what a mess. I mean, like, seriously, I just want to get popcorn and just sit down and just watch what these, some of these people are doing. I mean, it's like, but I feel bad for them because nobody's going to win that mess. And my Bible says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on me, me, to be peaceable with all people. That doesn't promote pacifism. It just says, as much as it's possible within me. And so we need to, we need to make sure we've exhausted us every time when we're trying to be holy and righteous and compassionate at the same time. Amen? All right. So I'm going to turn to Luke 10, Luke 10, and we're going to be in, uh, I think it starts in 2025 20, is where we're going to be. I love a church that's willing to talk about this, a church that's willing to talk about tough subjects, and it doesn't matter what it is. A church that's willing to talk about tough subjects, they make a pathway for confrontation of that subject and the confrontation of the hidden that, that we have in ourselves and that confrontation opens up the possibility of healing. And so I love a church that does that. So the parable here that, that we're going to do has two parts to it. The first part is, is that there's a real interaction between Jesus and an attorney. But then Jesus shifts and he tells a parable, he tells a story in order to teach everybody in the room. So in Luke 10, it says in verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. Can I just tell you, it's not a good idea to try to test Jesus. Right? Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He wanted, what, what, the question is, what really matters here? Because eternal life is what matters. You know, what's happening here is just a prelude to when we get to heaven. If you think worship was too long here, you're going to be a little uncomfortable when you get to heaven. Right? Okay. Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? I always love it. Jesus asks, asks, answers with a question. His answer is a question, okay? And so the attorney said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself and Jesus said to him you have answered rightly do this and you will live it's a good deal man he answered, you know he got it all worked out right then but the attorney wanting to justify himself there's that justification said to Jesus who is my neighbor and this is when the parable begins Jesus answered him and said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, between, between Jerusalem and Jericho, there was a couple of ways that you could travel. The shorter way was up through these rocks and clefts where thieves and thugs and pirates would hide out. And so if you went that way, you knew there was a possibility that there was trouble up there. Especially if you went that way by yourself. And so back in that time, back in that day, if somebody went that way by themselves and they got, they got beaten up, they got their stuff taken, they would say, you knew better. You knew better. Why would you do that? And can I just tell you that's not the gospel of Jesus when we're dealing with people who are struggling and hurting in their sin? This is not the gospel of Jesus. In fact, I told you so is not an evangelism tool, right? We can look at people in their worst moments, in those toughest moments, we, if we could just have a little compassion for them. The reason when I started this morning, when I told you that, that it didn't matter what's going on in your life, if this, this subject doesn't hit with you, whatever is going on, 
in your life, your particular moment, God can take care of it. I want to tell you a story. I was 13 years old. I was 5'11". I had eight chin hairs, and I could grow them out and pull them out and make them look long. I'm 5'10 now. They don't tell you about that cruel little thing with height that happens as you get to the 60s. But as a 13-year-old, a bunch of my, of my buddies and I, we decided we would start our drinking career. And so I let the chin hairs grow. I had a pocket full of quarters. I went across the street from where we were camping, and I went in and I bought six quarts of country club malt liquor. Don't judge my drinking choice there. It was bad. It was. That's exactly why. So my buddies and I, we sat out in this field and we drank. And so here's the thing that happened that night. My buddies, they're all fine. As a 13-year-old kid, I unlocked a rage inside of me that I could not stop. I, the, I, I became obsessed every day with getting with somebody that had some money that would take me somewhere if I had some money and let me get alcohol. It was my obsession. As a 14, 15, 16-year-old kid, it was the same. As a 16-year-old, I got a car and a part-time job, and I was able to, to use my money to drink every single day. I was a functioning alcoholic, if there is such a thing, but I was still an alcoholic. As an 18-year-old, I signed a scholarship to play baseball at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and within one year, I had drank my way off of that scholarship. So my life was out of control, and I'm sitting, uh, I'm just drinking every night. I've got a job, making a little bit of money. I got a company car. I thought I was so cool. And I was sitting in downtown Chattanooga one night and, uh, with a buddy of mine. And 512 over here, she just, she just comes walking by. And I looked at her and I looked at my buddy and I said, I'm going to marry her. And he said, you're an idiot. He said, you don't even know her. Uh, August 6th this year, we'll be on 35 years of marriage. Yeah. God's a good God. So I pursued her, um, got her to go out with me. I don't know if y'all have one here in Arizona, but I'm sure they're in every state, the Hall of Fame of Worst First Dates. My, my picture is displayed in every one of them, I think. Uh, by the end of the evening, when we parted ways, she looked at me and said, if you even think my name, don't say it out loud. That was the endearing impression that I had made on my, my love. And so uh, I had to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. Finally, we ended up dating and getting married. And that was in, you know, just in a short period of time and... In 92, Sheila told you that she got her healing. She got re reacquainted with this Jesus, the Jesus that forgives the sin of abortion, the Jesus of salvation, the Jesus who loved her, the one that forgave. And when she had that moment, she decided that Jack needed Jesus. I knew I needed salvation. I knew that. I knew my life was out of control. I just had never thought that somebody could be Lord over me. That was, that was my sticking point. And so she began this journey of, of trying to get me to church every single Sunday. And we would have just the worst fights. I mean, just explosive communication. And, we, you know, it was just, it was bad. So I didn't know it, but she started taking these classes online. It's how to make her husband's life hell on earth if he don't go to church with you. She was a 4.0 student. Men, if you're in the room, if you're in the room, I'm sorry, you're, you're destined for Jesus. I'm just going to tell you. She wouldn't give up on me, though. She would not give up on me. And, and so on September 5th, 1998, I had a typical Saturday. I, I started drinking about 10 o'clock. I drank all day. I passed out late in the evening. And the next morning, there's my beautiful wife standing over me. Hey, are we going to church? And I said, I don't, uh, yes, we are. Because I didn't want to argue. I didn't want to fight. I wanted to just have peace in the house. I wasn't pursuing Jesus. I wasn't pursuing a relationship. I wasn't so messed up over how bad I'd gotten. This was 23 years of alcoholism. 
And so we went to church that day and sat in third row back, aisle seat, left-hand side of the building right there. I always find it. It's an altar of victory. The Lord started speaking to me, and he said, Jack, you give me everything or I'm going to take everything from you. And the very thing I said first was, Lord, I don't know how. I acknowledged him for the thing that I wouldn't acknowledge him for. And I said, Lord, I don't know how, but I want it. And he said, I will take you by the hand and lead you home. I am 24 years sober, and God is a good God. You can give him a hand right there. So when I tell you, when I tell you that it doesn't matter why you're here this morning, I have no idea what my pastor was preaching that morning. But I do know that he, that he had set the atmosphere. They had set the atmosphere with worship, and the word was being spoken, and God moved in that moment with me. So I'm thankful for a church that believes in the, in the, the incredible power of prayer, the incredible power of worship, and the incredible power of setting the atmosphere for Holy Spirit to do what Holy Spirit does. I was beaten and broken and half dead. I had no physical ability within me to say no to alcohol. If somebody said, hey, Jack, we're going to have drinks after church, or after, not after church. <laughs> that was a whole different fight with me and her. After work, I would say yes. If I walked by a cooler in a grocery store or in a convenience store, I couldn't walk by without buying. I was physically beaten and broken and half dead. Sheila, in that seven years of being life unhinged, when she had become reliant on drugs and alcohol, she was beaten and broken and half dead. And what's the common factor between the two of us? It's Jesus. Because Jesus will do exactly what He said He would. In fact, He does it every day. He did what He said He was going to do, and then He does it every day in people's lives. Those stripes that He took on His back for healing, they're for me they were for her and they for anybody in this room. It doesn't matter if it's physical. It doesn't matter if it's mental or spiritual. It just Jesus does what He says He does. But what does He do? He works through people. He trusts us. Can you believe that He trusts us to do that? His, his word in 2 Corinthians says that we are to comfort others with the comfort that we've been comforted with by God. In other words... I'm standing here and telling you that I had a problem with alcohol and drugs. Somebody might be comforted by knowing that Jesus saves, that Jesus delivers. I haven't had a drink since that day, since September 5th. I haven't had a single drink. I didn't, I, hadn't, I didn't run in and out of it like some people do. I didn't struggle with it. God just delivered me from it. <laughs> Sheila... After going through, that mine was deliverance. Yeah, Sheila, she was delivered by discipleship because she went through that Bible study week after week after week. And week after week after week, she started getting her life back. God's Word changes us. So we just have to allow Him to do His part. Because He always does what He says He'll do. But He works through people. He worked through her for me. Her and her sisters, that praying band of group of people. I love them. Man, I love them. So here's the thing. You got this guy beaten, broken, and half dead. He's laying there. This is what God does. Now by chance, a certain pre there's, there's so many people that could have been the hero in this story. Now by certain chance, a priest came by. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The guy's laying over here. The priest saw him and he goes down this aisle. Why does he do that? Because he's ceremonially clean. And ceremonially clean takes a long process to get into. If he gets near a dead or dying body, then he has to start all over again. So what did he do? He took, he took prom prominence. He took position. And he bypassed compassion. And then a Levite came down. You can't be a priest if you weren't born into it. You can't be a Levite, if, a, a Levite priest if you weren't born into the tribe of Levi. A Levi, when he arrived at the place, he at least kind of came over and looked at the guy, but he goes down the same side. He got away from him. They chose religion over compassion. They chose religion over the relationship with the person that's laying there. So many churches do that. Churches tell us all the time, no, we don't have people like that. What are people like that? 
people that sin? Well, it's us. It's all of us. Maybe you don't have the abortion sin in your past, but can I tell you, there's none righteous, not one. <laughs> but then there's Jesus. Jesus. So then a Samaritan comes by. Can I just tell you, Jesus is teaching in a room full of Jewish people. And Samaritans and Jews don't get along. They don't get along. They don't like each other. They call each other's names. They won't worship in the same place. One of them says you got to worship on the mountain. The other says you got to worship in the temple. Some of them don't. I, you know, we all have differences in our worship. We all have differences in the things. But the, the, the one common thing that we could all unite under is Jesus. And if we would unite under Him, then the unity would produce the anointing. And the anointing will break the yoke of bondage in people's lives. So the Samaritan comes by. Can I tell you, if you're going to invest in somebody's life that's beaten and broken and half dead, it doesn't matter if they're an alcoholic, a pornographer. It doesn't matter if they've got life controlling issues, if they're a drug addict. It doesn't matter what it is. We need to step in and help. But it will cost us. Listen, he came by and... He not only used his oil and his wine to help clean and then start the healing process, he put the guy on his donkey and he took him in and he bought him a place to stay. And then he said, if I come back and it costs more than what I've already given the innkeeper, let me know, I'll pay you then. It's going to cost us to do this, but it's worth it. Don't, don't listen to the whole story without thinking about yourself laying there beaten, broken, and half dead. And whatever it is that you've dealt with or are dealing with now, it's worth it to invest in people. So, Jesus finishes this story. Here's what it says. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the attorney says, he who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said to him, this is our mandate for today, this right here. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. If you know somebody that's struggling, invest in them. If you know somebody that's having a hard time, invest in them. If you know somebody that's having such a hard time that they can't even cope with everything that's going on in the world, invest in them. They're worth it. Just like we were worth it when we were laying there. Every one of us are worth this. Can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a second? So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for setting this moment in time. Lord, we thank you that you are still here with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. Holy Spirit, just move. Just start to move across this room right now. If you're in here right now and you know that your relationship is messed up, that you're not where you need to be with Jesus and you want to fix that. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm just going to ask you this question. Do you want to get your relationship right with Him? If you're in here and you want to do that, just stick your hand up right where you are. Just right where you are. Just say, hey, thank you, I see you. Thank you, I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. There's somebody else. You're struggling. You don't know... You don't know why you got to stick your hand. I see you. Thank you. God, listen, I see you. Thank you. God wants to have that relation. I see you back there, man. God wants to have that relationship with you. It's as simple as confessing and believing. That's all the Bible says you have to do. We're just going to pray a short prayer. I see you. I see you. We're just going to say a short prayer. And that's going to establish your eternal home. And it's going to establish this date with you as your day of victory. Just repeat this prayer with me. Everybody in the room say, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask forgiveness. God, I pray that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness, that you would be my Lord, and you would be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Give them a hand, guys. Give them a hand right now. All the angels of heaven are rejoicing over just one. All right, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads one more time. And this includes you guys on the stage. I don't want you looking. At, and those of you in the booth in the back, don't look. This is a very sensitive subject. I get that. 
And I'm not going to ask this question if I see anybody looking around because this is, this is, this is such a, a sensitive moment in time. If you've been affected by the abortion issue, if you've chosen, if you coerced, if you are complicit, if you pushed, if you paid, if you drove, if you lost a child, if you lost a grandchild, whatever it is, those of you, in, please, heads bowed and eyes closed. Thank you. If you're in this room, I'm not going to ask you to even raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come forward. I'm just going to ask you this. Would you look up at me? This is, thank you. I see you guys all over. Wow. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I know it hurts. I know. I'm going to pray for you right now. For those of you that looked up, will you just please touch base with Pastor Dale or Pastor Darla? Will you let them know that you're ready to, to get out of this pain, out of this hurt, out of this, out of this station in life? You don't have to live here. You don't have to live the way you came in today. Lord, we just ask right now that you, that you send Holy Spirit as comforter in a way that He has never been. They've never known Him in, his, in their entire lives. Let Him comfort today in a supernatural way. God, thank You for the, for the courage that it took for those to look up. Lord, thank You, God. Would You wrap Your arms around them? Would You let them know that You are here? And God, that You're with them every step of the way. Lord, we know that you do deliverance. And I, God, if, they do, if you do that in this, in this service, then praise God. But Lord, let them understand the delivery of discipleship. Let them understand walking through your word week after week after week to have that change in their lives. Lord, in all things, always, we give you praise. We give you glory and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.